Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran on this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome also to our guests and visitors who are with us on this Sunday. We are grateful for your presence. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we invite you to look on the back cover of the bulletin. You'll see a note on the way we worship as Lutherans at the very top, and also a note about Holy Communion. We would ask for you to please read and observe as well. And if you don't mind, we ask our visitors to fill out the white card that's in the hymnal rack and please place that into the offering plate that we may get to know you and meet any needs you've checked on that card. It is a joyful day uh, to be gathered by our Lord to receive his gifts. It is also rally day, the beginning of our new Sunday school um, and adult teaching season. Uh, our younger children, some will be moving to their new classes today. And during the service, we also have the joy of placing our Sunday school teachers who have taken up the task to teach the children the faith that they may never depart from it and never be deceived in their lives. So uh, continue to pray for your Sunday school teachers who assist the minister in teaching all of God's word. You'll see from the bulletin that is Divine Service Setting 3. The service is printed out in its entirety if you desire, or you could use the hem book, Divine Service Setting 3 from Lutheran Service Book. And our first hymn on this 11th Sunday after Pentecost is, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, 
who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you have called us to enter your kingdom through the narrow door. Guide us by your word and spirit, and lead us now and always into the feast of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 66. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands afar off that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots and in litters, and on mules and on dromedaries, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. And some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. From new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle for today is from Hebrews chapter 12. 
In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which you have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had early, earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seems best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many may become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stone. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be, be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory be to thee, o Jesus went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and, taught, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. 
and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We now confess together our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The sermon text this morning is the Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 66. All flesh 
shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. What a happy ending to the scroll of Isaiah, this monumental book of prophecy. The only problem is there's one more verse. I've included it in your bulletin. Verse 24 says, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. That's not so happy of an ending. In fact, it's quite terrifying. Perhaps the people who put together our lectionary, our system of readings, wanted to spare us the horror of Isaiah's ending. Maybe they thought you couldn't handle it. There's a Jewish tradition in synagogues of repeating verse 23 of Isaiah chapter 66 after reading verse 24. So the reading would end with a repeat of consolation and comfort and not this dreadful warning. Instead of the reading ending with their worm on not dying on decaying flesh and their fire not being quenched, it would end with all flesh again coming to worship before the Lord. As Lutherans, we can appreciate this effort by Jewish liturgists. When it comes to preaching, at least, pastors are trained to proclaim the law and then the gospel, and we are taught that the gospel is to predominate. That normally means not ending the sermon with the law. The law is to be delivered first to strip people of all self-righteousness and to reveal to them why they are lost and condemned without a Savior. Then the gospel delivers that Savior. But why leave out this last important verse of prophecy in our reading? At the end of Isaiah, we are given a vision of the culmination of God's mission work on the earth. All the nations are gathered to see God's glory, but there are two outcomes, not one. There is eternal worship on God's holy mountain, and there is destruction. The first outcome is what God desires, but many will rebel unto the end and will receive eternal destruction. Now recall that the book of Isaiah begins with God's indictment on Israel and the rebellion of the people. God calls on the heavens and the earth as witnesses, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner. And the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. In large measure, the people of both Israel and Judah had rebelled against God. They turned from God's commands and separated themselves from God's ways. In addition to their many sins of dealing treacherously with each other, their chief sin was against the first table of the law. It was idolatry. The people had cheated on Yahweh, their faithful husband. Their sins of rebellion are what separated them from the true God who loved them. If you read throughout the book of Isaiah, you'll note that God delivers the prophecy of judgment on Israel and Judah so that the people will know of their wickedness and know it is a stench unto the Lord. The Assyrians are prophesied to come as the rod of God's anger, and Judah will be given over to the army of Babylon. The separation that the people brought about with their idolatry, God confirms by scattering his people in judgment. Also in the book of Isaiah, there are oracles of judgment against the surrounding nations that have rebelled against the true God and oppressed his people. The prophet proclaims destruction on these nations for their many sins of violence and their worship of false gods. All of this God does in mercy so that this rebellion of the people will not end in their eternal destruction. Yahweh longs to gather both Jew and Gentile to his holy mountain to worship him on that mountain of peace. But in the end, rebellion cannot stand. It must be dealt with. What the Old Testament certainly highlights then is that our sins are no laughing matter. It is not a slight offense against God when we trust in idols, idols of money or princes or self. It's not a light thing when we commit violence or deceit against our neighbor. 
Our sins of false doctrine and false worship also grieve the Lord. Despising the Lord's, Lord, the Lord's word, hating our neighbor, coveting or lusting after things that are not to be ours, all are worthy of judgment. If we were to stand on our own righteousness, the verdict would be rebel. And the place for rebels is where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, verse 24, the final verse, certainly calls to mind the historical event of when the Assyrians besieged Jerusalem in the days of King Hezekiah. This is recounted in chapters 36 and 37 of Isaiah. Sennacherib's envoy taunted the king of Judah and his people by saying, Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And when Isaiah gave King Hezekiah a comforting prophecy, and when Hezekiah then prayed unto the Lord, we are told, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. What we see in this case is that not only are the enemies of God destroyed utterly, but that God's people will be vindicated. I was just in St. Louis at a Cardinals game in a stadium that holds around 46,000 people. The destruction on the Assyrian army was over four times that number. Think of all of those bodies strewn on the earth. I'll read about the Battle of Franklin right here in our community or go and visit the battlefield and hear the stories of the Confederate soldiers surveying the carnage the day after. You can read about the Carter family emerging from their home and finding their relative Todd shot in the head and clinging to life for just a few more hours. Even General John Bell Hood, the Confederate commander, sat on his horse and wept like a child after he saw the devastation of his army. And then he sat down and just sat there and pondered what to do next. It was said about the Battle of Franklin that it was the day that the contending elements of hell turned loose and the day that the devil had full possession of the earth. One of the Confederate generals recounted much later that moment when they ran towards the battle line and the federal regiments stood up and fired, he said, it seemed to me that hell itself exploded in our faces. It seems a mystery and a wonder how any of us ever reached the works alive. Well, in the end, on the last day, the carnage will be much greater. Much greater also than what was visited on the Assyrian army. And death will not end the judgment on God's enemies. It will be the unending day of hell. The theologian Reed Lessing writes, Since their worm keeps consuming their bodies, and their fire keeps burning them, the sinners are not obliterated in the sense that they have ceased to exist. They have been raised in body along with the rest of humanity. They continue to exist forever, but they, body and soul, are in torment. This is torture, not annihilation. This last verse of Isaiah, then, is important because it demolishes the twin hopes of unbelievers, annihilation or universalism. Annihilation is the false belief that when you die, that's it. You just cease to exist, body and soul. That's life is all you get. It's the rather cheap hope with which atheists comfort themselves. Universalism is the belief that all people will be saved regardless of what they believe, and thus there is no hell. This is the all paths lead to heaven heresy. But Isaiah speaks of two groups. One that will be gathered to everlasting life at the mountain of the Lord, and the other group that will be in everlasting torment. Our Athanasian Creed confesses the same. It says, at Christ's coming, all people will rise again and with their bodies, and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. 
based on the works done only as the fruit of faith in Christ alone will the groups be separated. Our Lord Jesus spoke the same way in his ministry. Much of the teaching of hell comes from the lips of the incarnate Lord. He told his disciples, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. These are the very verses, are the very words of the last verse in Isaiah. Captivity to sin brings eternal destruction, everlasting death. Jesus warned his disciples in love. Therefore, if Isaiah preached to a people that would not repent, how appropriate for the prophet to leave them with a warning. The law, lest they perish in sin and be thrown into hell. The gospel in the text is that God declares the time when all nations, all tongues will be gathered and they shall see his glory. God promises to set a sign among them. Surely Jesus is this sign, the word of God in the flesh. Luther calls the sign the gospel and the word, the banner by means of which the people are gathered. Thus, the people are gathered only in a certain way by the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Jesus himself proclaims the reality of the gospel in the, in the reading for today. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Jesus is the narrow door. Only through faith in him alone will anyone be gathered to God's holy mountain in heaven. Anything else that is brought as righteousness will not fit through the door, be it our works or our own theology or our false gods. They will not fit through the door. And the door will be shut at some point. Thus, here again are the two outcomes that we see in Isaiah. Those on the inside and those shut out in their rebellion where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those who are gathered from east and west and from north and south to the feast in the kingdom of God are those who come through the Son of God. Through Him alone, there is life for the nations. Jesus said, as His death on the cross approached, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to Myself. Jesus, then, is the sign and the means by which people from every nation may have peace with God and may worship Him on His holy mountain. It is through Jesus alone that there is atonement for our rebellion. The prophet Isaiah is exact in his prophecy of atonement from chapter 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, each to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. By his perfect obedience unto death and condemnation, the rebellion of all mankind was paid in full. It was impossible for man to cut the sin out of his body, but with it transferred to Jesus, there is forgiveness and life for the worst of the worst. Therefore, it is unnecessary and extremely tragic for someone to die in rebellion by rejecting Jesus. Why will they die in everlasting torment when they can live in Christ? The prophecy in our text reveals that the word of God is going out to the farthest reaches of the world. And the people are being brought back to the Lord as offerings to Him. What a tremendous picture of the culmination of God's mission work. The glory of the Lord is declared to the nations, a glory that is hidden in the suffering and death of Jesus. And by that gospel, the church of God is gathered. And how wonderful that we have been gathered by God's power alone 
gathered out of captivity and out of our rebellion. Even now, our God of mercy is calling the nations to himself through Christ and gathering them, as he does us this very day, gathering us in a foretaste of what is to come. Perhaps the most shocking words of Isaiah's prophecy of this text is the promise that God will make priests and Levites out of those who are not of the house of Aaron, even Gentiles. Only the priests of Aaron's line could go into the presence of God. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus gave up the Spirit on the cross so that the temple curtain was torn into two from top to bottom. Now there is a priesthood of all believers, as it says in 1 Peter. We now can enter into the holy place, into the presence of God, and approach Him. This happens each Lord's Day at the Lord's Supper. We enter into heaven by the blood of Jesus, through the curtain of His flesh, as it says in the book of Hebrews. Our Lord condescends with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, and He gives to us His true body and blood into our bodies, that our hearts are sprinkled and we are cleansed. This worship is a foretaste of that unending worship and that never-ending Sabbath that Isaiah reveals in our text. The Sabbath in the new heavens and the new earth where we will dwell secure. Covered in the blood of Jesus, And in the white robe of righteousness, the nations shall be gathered to worship the holy Lord God on his holy mountain. What Isaiah reveals is seen in Revelation chapter 7, which we've been discovering and studying together in our adult Bible class. The fulfillment of the church gathered from all nations around the throne of God and around the Lamb. On the final day of the Lord, there will be two and only two outcomes. True worship or everlasting destruction. The time of judgment will come for the living and the dead. Those who are preserved through faith alone will look out on the enemies of the cross of Christ and see their defeat, their eternal death. There will only be victory in the risen Jesus who has conquered sin and death, and there will be destruction. Thus, the last day will result in true worship or perpetual death. Our Lord Jesus suffered the latter so that you could experience the former, the eternal blessing of the heavenly gathering. Think of it. Jesus is familiar with the land of dead bodies where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. He suffered these torments of hell himself when he stood in the place of sinful mankind on the cross. The fire of God's judgment came down on him for every sin, for yours and mine. Jesus was not only cut off from the land of the living, but he was cut off from God the Father. Isaiah reminds us that this suffering servant was stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Jesus became the abhorrence to all flesh so that those who rebelled against God could have eternal life and would not, in the end, be an abhorrence in judgment. How incredible. Not only was Jesus made an abhorrence to all flesh, but he was made an abhorrence to God the Father. The Father recoiled and abandoned his Son, who had become sin for us. The Father turned away from his Son so that we could be gathered to him forever and never, never abandoned. Jesus is now resurrected and ascended, reconciled to the Father, having reconciled the world to God the Father. And now our Lord Christ has all authority, and he is the judge to come. However, the verdict is already in for you who believe on the Savior. Your rebellion has been accounted for. Payment has been made by the one who was sent to the world in love. You are forgiven in Christ, and you shall come and worship before the Lord forever on his holy mountain. Period. In your case, the text actually can end at verse 23. No extra verse of judgment is needed for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We stand for the offertory. Seated for the offering. Now invite our Sunday school teachers to please come forward and stand by the baptismal font. Dear brother and sisters in Christ, you have come to be placed as uh, teachers in the Sunday school of this congregation a work in which our Father in heaven has great joy. You are to assist the ministry of the word and the sacraments by instructing God's children according to his holy word. You are to prepare yourselves for this work by your individual and corporate study of the word of God and the faith drawn from it as it has been delivered to us in the creeds and confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. While holiness of life and work is the way of all who trust in Christ, it is especially important that you show yourselves by word and example to be patterns of good works and Christian devotion. In the presence of God and of this congregation, I therefore ask you, do you accept the, uh, the roles entrusted to you, and do you promise faithfully to carry out your duties 
and trusting in him and conforming yourself to his word in accordance with the faith of the Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, answer, I do. I do. I therefore place you as Sunday school teachers of this congregation in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and most merciful God, our Heavenly Father, enlighten and strengthen you in your office that you may be good and faithful servants to the glory of his name and the salvation of his people. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, to these your people the gifts of wisdom and discretion, kindness and faithfulness, so that they may effectively teach and guide. And grant to all your people a ready willingness to learn. Let the knowledge of your word be preserved and extended among us, that all may know you, and from the least to the greatest, praise you now and forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord, the Almighty and most merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. You may return to you, please. Continue with the prayer of the church. You'll see on page 14 those who are in need of our prayers who are listed before you. An uh, update to this list um, with a new um, notice is from uh, Michelle Irwin's family at the death of Ernesto that happened this week. Um, we pray for them in this time of grief, uh, but with a time of certain joy. Um, for uh, Michelle and her entire family as they agree with certain hope in Christ. Also, um, prayer request uh, has come in from um, Carl Hedrick for the family of Betty at her death. Uh, this is a friend from a previous congregation where Carl worshiped. Pray for them also with certain hope. Betty was also a believer. We give thanks to God for taking her to the church triumphant. The congregational uh, prayer for each petition this day is, Lord, have mercy. I invite you to stand. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For strong faith to enter ever more deeply into the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation, and to gather many with us who would repent of their sins and enter God's kingdom, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For the everlasting church of God to draw boldness and confidence from the proclamation of his word, that she would declare God's glory among the nations, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all fathers called to bring up their children in the fear and love of God, that they would lovingly discipline their children and show forth the fatherly love of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For our nation in peril, for our president, the Congress of the United States, our governor and all those in authority, that God would grant them wisdom, integrity, and skill in their exercise of their lawful duties so that justice would be maintained, the innocent defended, wickedness restrained, liberty upheld, and consciences respected. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For crime and wickedness to be curbed, for our law enforcement personnel to be authorized and supported in stopping deadly drugs coming into our country, stopping human trafficking, that many would be rescued from violence, and that we may live in peace and security. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and all who suffer or grieve, including Joanne, Norlee, Ken, Michelle, Chris, and family, the family of Jacob, Robert and family, those recovering from the floods in Kentucky, the family of Ken, John, the family of Ernesto, the family of Jerry, and also the family of Betty, and the many others we know in our hearts that they would wait on divine deliverance and comfort, 
That they would trust the fatherly love of God who disciplines those He loves and who promises to never leave them nor forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the blood of Christ, which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, that we may give thanks to the Lord and for His precious blood to bless and sanctify our bodies to be a temple of His eternal dwelling. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the right worship of the Lord on earth as it is in heaven, that with thanksgiving for all the saints who have gone before us, we would die to ourselves and enter with Christ into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to join with all the angels in festal gathering and to be numbered with the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, perfected in the righteousness of Christ and abiding forever in His new creation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, knowing that you will hear the prayers of your people and answer us with your mercy, providing all things needful and beneficial to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be he with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
for the Nunc Dimittis. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated for a few announcements. Again, as I said, it is rally day. You can see um, Anna Hedrick. Is she around? There you are. If you need help getting to your class or what class you're in, thank you, Anna, for leading the Board of Education for us. Are there other announcements today? Yes, ma'am. The 40th anniversary is on September 11th. It's at the normal time, right here, worship time. And we'll have our uh, class 
uh, Sunday school, and then potluck afterwards. Yes, there was another. Yes. Okay, now we are. Very good, very good. Yes, sir. Very good. Thank you. Any others? If not, we go forth in the name of Jesus.